Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anne Nagshma Abusa. I'm the director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies. Um, and it is my great pleasure to welcome today in this enormous crowd um, Serhii Plochi, who is the Mihailo Khrushevsky Professor of Ukrainian History at Harvard University. He's a premier historian of Ukraine and its region. And Professor Plochi is an author of eight books, including <laughs> histories of the Cossacks, of religion, of na national and pre-national identities, and modern Russia. His latest book, um, about which he'll talk today, is called The Last Empire, The Final Days of the Soviet Union, and was published just this spring. Um, and today we welcome him with great delight to the Weiser Center for a lecture entitled The Empire Strikes Back, The Dissolution of the USSR and the Russian Invasion of Ukraine. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for coming. Uh, I'm a little bit still recovering from the cold from from Boston, but I'm 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 sure that with the help of this mic I will be able to to last for one hour, two hours, or what, how how long you want me to to be here, and as long as you will have questions, I will be happy to answer them. It's a great pleasure to be here. I heard so much about Ann Arbor. My predecessor at Harvard, Professor Roman Sprluk, taught here. And uh, one of graduate students was undergrad here as well. So, and for me, this is the first time that I'm here. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm very uh, grateful, and and uh, it's it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, what I'm going to talk about will be a combination of two things. Uh, one is a book talk. Part of that, given that there is no book. There will be just a talk, and and uh, not for not, not not for the entire duration of the lecture, and then what I'll try to do, I'll try to link together the uh, uh, themes that I dealt with in the book, which is called the Last Empire, the Final Days of the Soviet Union, and what is what is happening today in that part of the world, in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, and Russia. I like this this uh, cartoon very much because it links uh, the current events in Crimea, in Eastern Europe, in Donbass, with the history of the disintegration of the Soviet Union. And one of the arguments that I will try to make today is that what we witness today is really a continuation of the saga of the disintegration of one of the last traditional classic empires. Uh, the Soviet Union, the debate is still going on whether it was an empire or not. What I'm trying to argue in my book is that, while it doesn't matter, it died the death of an empire, uh, disintegrating along the lines drawn by nationalities, languages, and cultures, and then embodied in structure, structure of that state. Uh, the book uh, appeared in print in May here in the United States and in July in Britain. It was in Britain two days before the uh, Malaysian airplane was shut down. And it was basically envisioned as a book of history, something for me quite unusual because it, is, it was recent history. I normally write about people who are long and safely dead. Uh, the, the, this time around, it was different, and it was really, uh, I, I, I wasn't sure what to expect, because you always are afraid that someone in the audience will stand up and say, OK, you got it wrong. I was there, and it was not, uh, no, no, not the way how you describe that. So that didn't happen. But what happened was that immediately after the publication, the book of history or the book that was researched, envisioned, written as a book of history, started to be looked as a, a reference book almost on the current crisis. And again, I, I didn't know what would happen. Uh, no one except of my publisher, the basic book at that point, was interested in, in the project and thought that it had, it had relevance. Many publishers said, well, it was 91. Who cares about that? This is not relevant anymore. So it, it, it became relevant. And again, uh, this, this, this also points to limitation of us as scholars, as the historians in general, to predict, thing, predict things. 
as I was working on my book, uh, the the mm, reason why I was doing that was that I was not satisfied with things that are out there and that I read. They explained many things, including Ron Sunni's uh, early take on the on the on the uh, 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 published in the 1990s on the. Uh, uh, history of, of, of the Soviet Union as a multinational state. But uh, I was very unhappy with what I, I heard on TV, with the kind of a discourse that existed in media in general. And this dissatisfaction was not limited just either to Russia or to Ukraine or to this country. Um, I, I, I thought that there was a very important part of the story that, that was missing. and. Uh, I will explain a number of, of uh, the uh, dominant narratives of the disintegration of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War that exists all over the world and against which I was trying to build up my argument. So one of them is uh, the uh, treatment of the fall of the Soviet Union as a result of uh, American victory in the Cold War. So I, I start my book with describing the events of the 25th of December of 1991. Uh, on that day, CNN showed the uh, uh, broadcasted resignation speech of uh, President uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. And a few hours after that, President Bush explained to the Americans what actually happened and explained the uh, meaning of the picture that they saw, the, the, the red banner of the Soviet Union going down on the, on the uh, flagpole of the Senate building in Kremlin. And in that explanation, he used term victory five times. And again, what, what I will try to argue later, argue on the basis of the documents coming from the Bush Presidential Library, is that the United States of America didn't want the Soviet Union to disappear, or at least the presidential administration, the White House. Uh, up until almost the very end, everything was done diplomatically possible to keep the Soviet Union alive and the Soviet Union going. And then it was in December, the, 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 the turnaround, uh, declaring the what basically was, was a, a uh, not exactly defeat, but certainly not a victory of, of American foreign policy as a victory in the Cold War. Well, the problem is that this interpretation of the disintegration of the Soviet Union and fall of the Soviet Union as the result of American victory in Cold War is something that is popular not only in this country, much more dangerous take on, on this same theme is in Russia where you can see uh, major uh, writers, major historians, and also media talking about such things as CIA plot, as Harvard project. Uh, th this is my seventh year at Harvard. Probably I have to spend more time there to find out what that Harvard project was and who those people were. I, I, I suspect Tim Colton and, and Jago Shackard, but I'm not sure yet. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm still working on who were those people at Harvard who, who, who designed the, 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 the disintegration of the Soviet Union. And a lot of today's rhetoric, including the rhetoric that underlines the current Russian policy in the Crimea, in Eastern Europe, is underwritten by this interpretation that the uh, disintegration of the Soviet Union, this is something that was imposed by the United States of America on weak Russia, and, and, and with the, with the uh, goal, specific goal, to dismember the country, to humiliate, to, to uh, uh, create all sorts of economic, geopolitical, and other problems. Uh, another <clears throat> Uh, narrative that, again, I, I was trying to build argument against deals with the linking together not the end of the Cold War and the fall of the Soviet Union, but linking together the fall of communism and the end of the Soviet Union. And the argument goes that 
once the Communist Party was uh, suspended in Russia by the decree of President Yeltsin, that that the, the party was the glue, the glue that was keeping together the Soviet Union. Once the party was not there, was, once communism disappeared, not only as ideology, but also as, a, as uh, its institutional embodiment uh, was, was banned, then there was nothing to keep the Soviet Union together and, and it fell apart. Well, um, f f I had always a uh, problem with this argument, partly because the Communist Party was banned not on the territory of the Soviet Union, but on the territory of Russia. So it really didn't, it, 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 Yeltsin didn't have the powers to do that all over the Soviet Union. It was not banned, it was suspended, its activities. Second, it was suspended in Moscow and later in Kyiv and in Ufa, let's say, but Ufa somehow manages to be a part of the Russian Federation and Ukraine is not. So that explanation for me really didn't, didn't work. And on the top of that, when I looked closely at the events of the coup in Moscow in August of 1991, the very interesting thing was that the coup was run by the people who were so-called in Russian Siloviki. At the top was the head of the KGB, Mr. Krychkov, and then the second in command was the Minister of uh, uh, Defense, uh, the, 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 the military commander, Mr. Yazov. And it was when Yazov decided that he didn't want to be part of that anymore that the coup collapsed. So there were, in reality, if you look at that, only two remaining imperial institutions, the KGB and the army. The party was really somewhere on the sidelines. If the coup would succeed, probably the party would be the main beneficiary of, the, of, the, uh, uh, of that coup. But the party at that time didn't have any more any power to, to keep even itself together to say nothing about the Soviet Union. The leaders of the party by that time were elected presidents and, and uh, uh, chairmen uh, ch chairman of the parliament, speakers of the parliament, and so on and so forth. So you see, I'm quite picky. I didn't like this to this interpretation. Uh, then one more uh, take on, on when the Soviet Union fell apart, and the focus is on relations between these two uh, individuals. Uh, the, 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 the relations were really full of drama. I put as much as I can of that drama into my book. But I refuse to give 100% uh, of explanatory power to this relationship. And also, I am critical about a, a much more sophisticated argument that says that the, 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 the reason for the disintegration of the Soviet Union was the relations between the center and the Russian Federation. This argument is, is, is quite strong argument, and it explains good part of things that happened in the Soviet Union, but again, I don't think, I don't think it's, it's a key. So what is my argument? Well, uh, what I'm trying to show in the book that the key for the disintegration of the Soviet Union were not the relations between Bush and Gorbachev, that means not the American policy toward the Soviet Union, not the, the relationships within the party, and not even the relationships between the Russian Federation, the largest republic, and the center. What I'm trying to show is that the key for the disintegration of the Union were the relationship between two largest Slavic republics, between Russia and Ukraine. And it was inability of the political elites of these two republics to find modus vivendi within the parameters of one state that led eventually to uh, meeting in Belaveja, in B Visculi, the official statement on the disintegration, uh, on the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union and creation of the Commonwealth of Independent States. Uh, 
in that sense, the independence that Ukraine declared on December 1st, 1991, was of course the, the key element after which Russia refused to sign the agreement, the Union Treaty Agreement that was prepared by Gorbachev as well. So this is, this is in very general terms what, what uh, my argument is. Uh, I recently read somewhere uh, the, the, the what is behind the, the, the way how the articles in, in media are now constructed, that in the first paragraph there is the main argument and then there is uh, explanation of what it means. And apparently that comes from the 19th century, where the uh, news information was sent on telegraph, and telegraph was really very, wasn't reliable. So in case there is a break in transmission, at least people somewhere in, uh, I don't know, Boston or Midwest or wherever they were, had to publish at least something. There would be at least one paragraph, would be the gist of the argument. So I guess I'm doing the same in case my voice collapses. At least you know what, what, what is right and what is wrong and what, what the, the, the argument is. And now I'll try to, I'll try to explain that in uh, more detail. Well, uh, I'm trying to look at the, at the uh, history of the disintegration of the Soviet Union as, and, and put this history into the context of the disintegration of the largest empires, European empires in the 20th century. So I use the term empire in the title not just to increase sales, empire is, is, is the word that, that is, is, is very powerful one, but actually try to treat this, this approach, uh, the, 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 the term itself, the, the category itself, uh, quite, quite seriously. And uh, uh, mm, the, the, uh, this approach helped me to answer a number of questions. One of them was the question that was really considered to be a very smart one until this year. I was asking it again and again and even delivered a talk at Woodrow Wilson. The title of the talk was, Why Did Russia Let the Republics Go? Of course, I'm not asking this question anymore uh, in, in, in the year 2014. But with certain qualifiers, the question can be still considered to be legitimate. How did it happen that in 1991 there was no major bloodshed, with the exception of, with the exception of uh, Chechnya? And again, looking looking at the history of the disintegration of the empires, comparing it to what was happening in the Soviet Union, uh, one of the possible explanations is that Russia left its empire on conditions, economic conditions, much better than any other metropolis in the world. Because most of the metropolis you look at, at, at Britain, you look at France, by losing empires, they were also losing access to the resources. Most of the resources in the Soviet Union in 1991, the richest resources were gas and oil, which were on the territory of Russia. So, Russia, it's, it's, it's a unique, unique case in the, in the history of disintegration of the empires when Russia left with resources and on the spot immediately economically benefited from the collapse of the empire as opposed to, to mm, mm, uh, losing, economically losing as a result of that. My, sto uh, my story begins uh, in July of 1991, with the last summit when President Bush comes uh, comes to Moscow and then makes a short stop over in Kiev. And uh, um, it was there that uh, basically I, I start to discuss the American policy on the uh, uh, Soviet Union and on the future of the Soviet Union. And what uh, Bush said to the Ukrainian parliament on the August 1st, 1991, during that uh, stopover, five or six hour stopover in Kyiv, was that the uh, Americans would not, uh, are against the suicidal nationalism, and that it's wrong to confuse freedom with independence. 
And uh, I, I interviewed a number of members of uh, uh, Bush administration at that, uh, who were at that time there. And they were saying, well, it was, it, it, it was a mistake. We were misunderstood. The emphasis were wrong, and so on and so forth. Well, when you put this particular speech into the context of the debates that were happening at that time in the White House, it is quite clear that it wasn't a mistake. That was a very important speech that at that point um, formulated the American policy toward the Soviet Union. And that policy was quite simple. The United States of America were pushing as hard as they could for uh, independence of Baltic states. That was a policy that was there already by, by August of 1991 for a number of years. But what was said in Kyiv was that what was good for the Baltic states was not good for the rest of the republics. So the United States of America and President Bush in particular were really very concerned about the nuclear arsenals and the future of nuclear weapons on the post-Soviet space. And in that way, that was a major factor that didn't allow them to act as one would expect from a victor, even in a cold war, not, 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 not in a hot war. And uh, independence for Kazakhstan, for Ukraine, for Belarus, the republics that had nuclear arms was, of course, something that was really very difficult to, to uh, uh, President Bush and his team to, to come to the grips with. And it was really events on the ground, events on the territory of the Soviet Union that led eventually them to, to contemplate that and to start looking for the ways of how, how the disintegration and dissolution of the Soviet Union could take place without without endangering the um, uh, world peace in general and, and uh, endangering the security of nuclear arms. Well, the, uh, it was three weeks after President Bush left the Soviet Union that the coup in Moscow took place. And uh, the coup was interesting in, in uh, many uh, ways, but one of them was that uh, the uh, plotters refused to arrest immediately uh, the president of the Russian Federation, Mr. Yeltsin. And uh, there was a number of reasons for that, and one of reasons was that there was hope till the very end that knowing that relationship between Gorbachev and Yeltsin were really very, very poor, that Yeltsin would decide actually to side with the plotters in a hope to, um, uh, uh, to get rid of Gorbachev and then, and then try and to make deal with him. At the time when the coup happened, a major negotiation took place between Gorbachev and Yeltsin. And according to the agreement that they reached before the signing of the new Union Treaty, Russia and the republics in general were becoming the uh, owners of the resources in, on their territory, so oil and gas. So by the time the coup had happened, Yeltsin had much more to lose from derailing of that agreement than had Gorbachev. He made a smart decision, putting forward as his main demand vis-a-vis -vis the plotters the return of Mr. Gorbachev to power, which came as a surprise to the plotters, which was embraced by President Bush and the West, and that provided the uh, resistance to the coup with, with the legitimacy that otherwise it wouldn't have. And as you know, the coup collapsed only after three days. And Mr. Gorbachev came back to Moscow. On plane to Moscow from the Crimea, he told to his advisors that, you know, we are coming back, we are returning to a different country. He couldn't really know, pr he probably didn't know how right he was. 
because the country was different indeed. And what Gorbachev came to was what I, in my book, call a counter coup. So the plotters failed to get powers away from Gorbachev because of the resistance of Yeltsin. But within the next few days, most of the powers were taken away from Gorbachev by Mr. Yeltsin. Uh, I, 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 I describe that in detail, but I'll just give you one, one example that illustrates the, the, the situation. Uh, later that day, it's early hours of morning, August 22nd, later that day, Gorbachev signed decrees appointing his people as the minister, new minister of defense, the new head of the KGB, uh, and the new minister of interior. On the 23rd, in presence of Yeltsin in Kremlin, Gorbachev was pressured into actually canceling all of his decrees and appointing people who were recommended by Yeltsin. The government, the Soviet government that existed was dissolved. A new committee was created and the head of the committee became the head of the Russian government. What happened immediately after the coup, between 22nd, 23rd, and 24th of August, was effective Russian takeover of the center and Russian takeover of the Union. It was the day after that, on the 24th of August, 1991, that Ukraine declared its independence. The euro, the independence was from the Soviet Union. De facto, on August 24th, the independence was from Russia. And uh, in my opinion, this reinterpretation of what the Ukrainian independence was really it helps to explain the dynamic in relations between Russia and Ukraine after August 24th. Uh, one of the big questions about the Ukrainian independence and declaration of Ukrainian independence was how was it possible that the parliament that was dominated by the communists voted against Moscow, voted for independence, something that they were fighting against for so long period of time. How Kravchuk, who the, the head of the parliament who vacillated and, and w w was sitting on the fence during the coup, how he decided to, to, to throw his support behind independence. Well, uh, normally the explanation is given that the uh, Yeltsin banned the Communist Party and the, the communists believed that their days were numbered and basically declared independence of Ukraine as a, as a kind of a communist, communist land to, to, to build a wall between the democratic Russia and, and communist Ukraine. Well, uh, by the 24th of August 1991, the category of communists, I don't find them any more helpful in terms of its analytical ability. By that time, party is divided into so many factions that when Gorbachev, uh, sorry, when Kravchuk tries to push through the vote for Ukrainian independence, he is not meeting with party caucuses. He meets with regional groups of deputies. So those groups were still groups with which you can work and which, within which there was discipline and other things. But what Kravchuk and others are voting against. They're voting against what is happening at that time in Moscow. And it wasn't the, the uh, uh, suspending the activities of the Communist Party. That was effective takeover of the central government by Russia. So the Ukrainian communists, if, if you want to work in, in these categories, were reluctant to declare independence from the Soviet Union. But with the center taken over by Russia, or in the process of being taken over, that, that uh, uh, declaration of independence for them was, was something that they considered to be absolutely, absolutely important. 
Ukrainian independence was a very particular phenomenon. Ukraine was not the first country that declared its independence. Baltic states were ahead of Ukraine, uh, uh, Moldova, Georgia, so a number, an, a number of countries were ahead of Ukraine in declaring their independence. Ukraine, one year earlier, declared its sovereignty, which meant the, the, the uh, predominance of the republican uh, laws on the territory of a uh, given republic only after Russia. So Ukraine was really very uh, slow in, in embracing the, 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 the idea of independence. But once Ukraine did that on the 24th of August of 1991, within one week, most of all other republics declared their independence from the Soviet Union as well. And the, the reasons, uh, at least I am trying to argue, were again the same. The reasons were that they didn't want the replacement of weak center in Moscow with Gorbachev by a strong and powerful Russia with Yeltsin. And it was at that time, in late August of 1991, that for the first time we hear from the uh, uh, Russian government words about Donbass, about Crimea, about northern Kazakhstan, eastern Ukraine, and territorial claims for the, um, um, uh, 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 against the republics that are declaring independence. The situation changed immediately after the coup. Before that, Boris Yeltsin was together with Kravchuk and Nazarbayev and, and Karimov and other Republican leaders pushing for as much autonomy and independence from Gorbachev Center as it was possible. But after 22nd and 23rd, it was now Yeltsin who was in charge in Moscow and was not Gorbachev. And once in a sudden, Yeltsin finds himself in the situation when he has to save the empire. And the way to save the empire is threatening the countries that declare independence with possible partitioning of their territory. It didn't work at that time. It didn't work for a number of reasons. One of them was that immediately the presidents and the leaders of other republics rebelled, declared their own independence. But also the United States of America was trying to use whatever power White House had to convince Yeltsin that what he was going to do was wrong. They were doing that not on behalf of the republics. They were doing that on behalf of Mikhail Gorbachev. Mikhail Gorbachev was a person who was well known in the White House, in the White House with whom it was comfortable to work. He was predictable. At the same time when Boris Yeltsin had really very little in terms of, uh, of um, uh, respect on the part of the senior members of administration. He was once in the United States before that. His behavior was quite erratic. Condoleezza Rice could not stand him. Scowcroft could not stand him. Uh, in August of uh, 1991, when uh, Gorbachev's were given reception to Bush, uh, uh, Yeltsin was trying to play host, uh, uh, did, uh, was late, and, and, and then was trying to escort Mrs. Bush to, to, the, to, to, uh, to the main table, so uh, everyone was upset. He made then uh, Bush wait for, for I don't know uh, w w what period of time. So White House found it really very difficult to work with, with Yeltsin. And that was one also, one, not the main, but one of the reasons why the policy was to keep Gorbachev in power as, as long as possible. Despite the fact that from American point of view, Yeltsin was actually offering to the White House things that Gorbachev was not prepared to offer, including the recognition of the independence of the Baltic states. Gorbachev was really 
dragging his feet all the way after the coup into the early, uh, early September of 1991, when Yeltsin was actually making the statement much earlier, uh, uh, really at the beginning of the year. But there, were this, there was this also interpersonal relations which, which were a contributing factor to what was happening at that time. So because of the revolt of the republics, because of the position taken by the United States, the takeover by Russia of the center in Moscow in late August of 1991 didn't succeed. So what was established instead was the policy, the, 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 the situation of so-called dual power, or in Russian, Dvayevlastia, which was the, the, the term that comes also from 1917. And it was at that time that Russia makes a really very important decision regarding its own future. And at that point, it became clear that, all, uh, or later it became clear that also it was a decision with regard to the future of the Union. In October of 1991, Boris Yeltsin embraces the program of so-called Young Turks, represented by uh, Yegor Gaidar, a person who is, he is on the right there, of the uh, radical economic reform. The vision was that within one year, it will be very difficult, very painful, but the economy will be completely changed. Why Yeltsin decided to do that? Because uh, people like uh, Gaidar, like Burbulis, his uh, chief advisor at that time, explained to him that the economy is in the free fall. Yeltsin, in September, was still very and very popular. But they told him that if he doesn't do something dramatic about the economy, his approval rating will be actually lower than was Gorbachev in September. So he had to do something to to, to uh, survive in power for more than one year. And the decision was to embark on this uh, program of reforms. What that also meant was that Russia would have to go alone when it comes to the economic reform for a number of reasons. One of them was that if Yeltsin concentrated power in Russia in his hands and was decided to implement those reforms. The communist controlled legislatures in the most of the uh, publics would be actually dragging their feet. That reform on the all union level within one year was impossibility. It was impossible on Russian, on, 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 uh, in the scope of Russia Federation as well, but at, at that point they didn't understand that. But on the union level it was clear that if Russia wants reform, it has to go alone. And the second thing, it was explained to Yeltsin by Burbulis that we'll have to go alone, they said, because we just don't have resources and we can't feed the republics anymore. Uh, in September of 1991, at the meeting with, uh, between advisors of Gorbachev and uh, uh, Yeltsin, on the Yeltsin side, there were people like uh, uh, Burbulis and Shahrai present. On the Gorbachev side, his advisor, um, um, his name will come, uh, Shak Nazarov. Uh, it was explained, uh, the, 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 the Russian side explained to Shak Nazarov the, 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 Russian, the Russian policy. They said that Okay, Russia do doesn't have resources. We are not prepared anymore to pay for the republics. We are going our own way. In 20 years from now, that was September of 1991 when the negotiations were taking place, the republics will come back. And Russia will be stronger. And if they will not come back, well, it's their choice, but what we'll have to be sure that the republics that are bordering on Russia will be, will be back. So uh, I don't want to, again, now looking from what is happening today, it's, 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 it's very easy to draw a straight line between the discussion that was taking place in Moscow in September of 1991 and events of 2014. I'm not going to do that because there were different 
plans and different ideas that were floating around. But the vision of Russia going on its own and then, and then bringing the republics back in 20, 25 years certainly was there and was already articulated in negotiations between, between uh, Yeltsin and Gorbachev. Why did they tell all this to Shah Nazarov? The idea was that the vision for the, Yeltsin's vision for the future union was not the union but confederation, in which Russia would be a leading force. And the offer was made to Gorbachev to be a figurehead. And basically, in that sense, uh, he would stay in the politics, but also he would be someone who through whom Russia could, could basically exercise this, this influence over the Commonwealth. Gorbachev refused because one of the reasons was he couldn't stand to work under Yeltsin, and, and, and certainly there was no future, no future in that kind of relations. So by uh, November of 1991, Russia that has under its control all gas and oil resources, declares the beginning of the reform. Part of that reform is cutting funding for the all union ministries, including the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, including the presidential administration. So by late November of 1991, Gorbachev has no money to pay even his secretary. Uh, White House interferes trying to prolong the funding for the Soviet uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs so that it could send Gorbachev and its representatives to the conference on the Middle East in Madrid, which was extremely important, and that was the beginning of the Oslo peace process. So the competition between Russia and the center was effectively over by November of 1991. So if you look at the, at the Soviet Union and disintegration of the Soviet Union and try to explain that by the relationship between center and, and Russia, that, the, 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 that, that happened earlier. But the Soviet Union was still, was still going on. It was still going on because uh, uh, Yeltsin was, was very much interested in its continuation. The change came after the Ukrainian referendum for independence on December 1st, 1991, where over 90% of the population voted for independence, 54% uh, in the Crimea, over 70% in Donbass. Uh, in Crimea, the highest uh, vote for independence, very interestingly, was in the, uh, the, uh, in the city of Sevastopol. If, if you are interested why, I have a couple of, of possible answers to that, but again, I, I'm, I'm no 100%, I don't know for, for sure. And uh, it was after the uh, vote for, for independence that this meeting of these three gentlemen took place in uh, a, f a few miles away from the Polish border in Belarus, in Viskuli, at the um, Belavieja. Uh, reserve. Um, well, the, the, what you can read from from the faces of, of people here, it's 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 very much. It, it seems to me this this illustration is excellent in terms of that it gives gives some idea about what positions were taken. Um, the person in the middle is the head of the Belarusian Parliament, Mr. Sh uh, Shushkevich, who is confused. <laughs> His plan was to bring Yeltsin to Belavezha to discuss the oil and gas supply to Belarus for the coming winter. Uh, and uh, then when the realization came that the dis what is being discussed is the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the head of the Belarusian KGB informed the KGB in Moscow about what was going on. Uh, eventually, Shushkevich said that, well, you are big guys. Whatever you agree on, we will, we will follow. 
When, when once the Belarusian delegation for the first time heard that the Soviet Union was disintegrating, then all got together and very interesting decision was made. Whatever happens, union or without union, we stick to Russia. It was oil and gas. That, 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 was, that, 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 that was the key, the key figure, the, the, the key issue. Negotiations started with Yeltsin producing Gorbachev's um, you know, Gorbachev's uh, uh, draft of the union agreement and telling Kravchuk, please sign. Kravchuk said, no, I cannot do that. We had a referendum. I am a president. I, 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 th there will be no union. Yeltsin says, well, if this is the case, Russia will not sign either. Why Russia would not sign without Ukraine? There can be a number of explanations, but there, are, there is one that Yeltsin gave President Bush at least twice. One in the summer of 1991 and the second time before the Ukrainian referendum uh, when they had a telephone conversation. Now it's wonderful, on, on, the, on the Bush Presidential Library website you have all these transcripts and, and uh, tons, tons of really very interesting material. So Yeltsin was saying that Without Ukraine, Russia will be outnumbered and outvoted by Muslim republics in the Union. So whether that was the sole reason why Yeltsin didn't sign that or not, or just one of the reasons that he gave to Bush, but that was one part, part of the thinking at that time. And what was happening then with, with, with these negotiations was that, and Belarusian example shows this very well, is that Russia is not signing because, Uc because Ukraine is not signing. But then no other republic would sign because Russia didn't sign. Because no one is interested in a shell of a union without Russia and Russian resources, with Gorbachev presiding over it. So no one is rushing into Union without Russia, and Russia is not Russian <laughs> without, without Ukraine. Uh, so at the end, they, they do something that Gorbachev attacked them almost immediately. They do something that they had no right to do. They dissolve the Soviet Union. According to the Constitution, each republic has the right to leave the Soviet Union. They come up with, Shahrai uh, comes with very fancy explanation that because the original agreement on the Soviet Union was signed by the four republics, Transcaucasian republics was one of them, it does, doesn't exist anymore, and the three original uh, uh, republics that signed are there, so they have the right to do with this with this uh, uh, union, whatever they want, and uh, this, is, this, is exactly, this is exactly what happens, and this is exactly what they're doing. Um, now, one more thing that I, I uh, try to challenge in the book, and this is the, the idea that the Soviet Union really came to an end uh, on uh, December 8th, so in any case, in December of 1991, let's say, with resignation of Gorbachev. The, I'll, 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 I'll come back to this map later. But the negotiations of what will happen and what the Commonwealth of Independent States will become were going on for additional almost 10 years. After the annexation of the Crimea uh, earlier this year, in March of 2014, uh, President Putin of Russia gave a long speech in which he tried to provide historical justifications for the Russian annexation of the peninsula. And he said one thing which actually resonates very well with the sources that I was looking at. He said, when the Soviet Union stopped to exist and the Commonwealth, the, the creation of the Commonwealth was declared, 
Many in Russia believe that that would be just another form of a statehood, that the, that will be a continuation of the Union under a different name. The, uh, very close to Yeltsin at that time, uh, Mr. Korzhakov, who was head of his security detail, said that, well, we all believe that we are negotiating a new union with the broader rights for the republics. So the story of the, of the disintegration of the union really doesn't end in December of 1991. The question, all important question of nuclear arsenals was resolved only in 94. This is the sh agreement. Part of that agreement was also the Budapest Memorandum that gave Ukraine guarantees of its territorial integrity and independence in exchange for nuclear arsenals. It was in 1997 only that the agreement between Russia and Ukraine was signed on the borders, on the recognition of the borders, and on Sevastopol, on the list of Sevastopol as a Navy base. It took the Russian parliament two years, between 97 and 99, to uh, vote and, and, and provide ratification for the, uh, of that agreement. So in reality, when you look at the settling territorial issues, nuclear issues, and so on and so forth, the, the story doesn't end in 91. It is there up until 1999. And there are two different visions of what the Commonwealth is supposed to be or not supposed to be. And again, the key players, like in the my story of 1991, it's Russia and Ukraine. Russia pushing for, actually, the Commonwealth as an as, 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 as instrument of Russian influence in the region. The ideas that the republics will come back didn't disappear anywhere. And the, if Russians think about Commonwealth as a new form of statehood, the uh, Ukrainians are thinking about Commonwealth as a way for, as they, sa as they were saying at that time, quote, unquote, civilized divorce. Uh, so it was quite civilized in the 1990s. It, it, it became really not very civilized later. Um, uh, the switch to, to <coughs> new kind of policies in Russia take place uh, at the end of uh, um, uh, previous millennium. Uh, they are normally linked with the uh, ascendance to power of uh, Mr. Putin, whom you see here. Uh, it, it looks almost like terrified a little bit. Um, um, oh, oh, certainly not enthusiastic and, and uh, uh, but um, the, the, the first signs are there, of course, even before Putin, with, uh, during the prime ministership of Mr. Primakov, this very dramatic gesture when in, uh, in mid-year over Atlantic, he turns the Russian plane that was going to Washington for official visit, turns around and returns to Moscow in protest against the uh, uh, NATO bombing of, of Serbia. And uh, uh, the uh, Russian, Russian uh, pro-Western policy really ends there in the 1990s. What, what uh, is introduced instead is the policy in the near abroad uh, that uh, um, basically um, doesn't pay much attention to the, to the interests, either republics or the interests of the West. Uh, when it comes to, to Russia, m now there is a lot of talk about the Cold War, whether we are on the, on the verge of a new Cold War or not. Uh, the arguments that I hear are, well, it's, it's, it, it's impossible. It's uh, mm, Russia with the GDP of Italy, the, the, just the, the, the kind of the 
the kind of the um, this division of the world and tensions that were there is just impossible for that simple reason. And I, I, I agree with this argument. What I want to say that in the area, in the post-Soviet space, the Cold War really never came to an end in the form that competition between East and, and Russia were there starting with 1991. It had different forms. And uh, uh, most of the time, it was uh, economic, uh, um, uh, economic uh, um, leverage, uh, oil and gas, in particular the, the uh, energy as, as a uh, means to achieving goal on the international arena that were were there, but there was also interference interference into the political process in the in other um, uh, countries of the region. And again, Ukraine Ukraine is one of the examples of that. In particular, the events of the uh, revolution, Orange Revolution of 2004. Uh, in November of 2004, I happened to be in Moscow walking on the, on the um, uh, main street uh, uh, on, on Tverskoy there, and on a big billboard, I, I suddenly see a portrait of Yanukovych, who was at that time contender for the presidency in Ukraine and was supported by Russia. And I thought, well, I, I clearly, it's, I am jet lagged, it's, it's impossible. I, I see Yanukovych everywhere including in the center of Moscow. The, 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 this makes no sense. Uh, I, I waited for another few minutes, and, and the portrait of Yanukovych came back. So basically, uh, um, the, the, the idea was that Russia opened, at that time, I don't know, hundreds of the Poland sta uh, uh, stations only, also in Russia, trying to increase the number of votes for pro-Russian pro candidate at that time. So uh, interference in the political process, the, the, the use of uh, energy uh, as, as uh, instruments of foreign policy, uh, all of that was mm, basically beefed up in the year 2008, uh, when for the first time Russia used military force not inside of the country, uh, the war in Chechnya was going on since 1991, but outside of the country's borders. And eventually, we got the, the, the new use of the Russian military force outside of its borders this year, first in the Crimea, and uh, then in, in eastern Ukraine, in Donbass in particular. Well, what is at stake there and why Russia is doing that? And, and here I would like to link, to link some of the, of the themes that are in the book and, and with, with the events that are happening today. One of the arguments that, uh, that we hear and uh, early in the year heard a lot uh, on, on CNN in particular and on other channels um, mm, uh, from Stephen Cohen in particular, that what is happening is actually a Russian reaction to uh, the decision to move NATO into, into uh, Eastern Europe and also on the territory of the former Soviet Union, in particular the Baltic states. And uh, I think that this is, this is a good way to explain maybe the crisis of 2008, when the Russian invasion of Georgia is taking place months after the Bucharest decision of the um, mm, NATO, to extend invitation to join the alliance for Georgia and Ukraine. It makes no sense in the case of today's developments in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine had no intention of joining NATO. 
West had no intention of actually taking Ukraine as member of the alliance. More than that, Ukraine maybe had intention, but no one was asking her to join European Union either. What was at stake in uh, the fall of 2013 and the beginning of this year was, think about that, not joining NATO, not joining European Union, signing an association agreement with European Union, which provoked then a reaction from, uh, from, from Russia first in the Crimea, with polite green, green men, and then the, uh, the uh, use of, uh, first of all, destabilizing situation in Donetsk and uh, supplying Russian, Russian um, weaponry uh, and uh, providing leaders of the, of the uprising and experts uh, in Donbass. And then in August of uh, 1991, actually sending regular uh, troops, uh, including this uh, Russian paratroopers that were uh, captured uh, by Ukrainians and then uh, sent, sent back to Russia. So using, using military force uh, in, in uh, Donbass and in eastern Ukraine. Um, so what is, what is at stake there? The signing of the association agreement with European Union precluded Ukraine from joining the economic union and customs union with Russia. So the Russian reaction and Russian use of force is not about stopping NATO or stopping European Union. It's about actually reconsolidating the post-Soviet space under its control creating an economic, political, and military bloc with the help of which it can be on par and compete with European Union on the one hand and China on the other. So from that point of view, I found it actually very telling that Mr. Putin's speech in March after the annexation of the Crimea was so much focused on the trauma of the disintegration of the Soviet Union, of the idea that Russia was weak then and the West took away all these things and now we are back and now we are trying to take the, what actually belongs to us. So it's not about, again, very often I, I heard, I, I was talking a lot this year and the question is, could we do something else? Is, is the United States or the West in general maybe provoked Putin? And, we could do something else differently. And, well, uh, first of all, uh, I, I would like to say that the story of the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the way how I researched it, how I understand it, how I presented it in the book, is not about the story of the West uh, demolishing that country and that state. That's about the disintegration of the empire and disagreements within the Union itself between Russia and Ukraine, with the United States till the very end trying to preserve the last, the last living empire. Second <clears throat> is that whatever the West would do after that probably would have very little impact on the desire of the current leadership of Russia to rebuild and reconstruct the Soviet Union. There are some important qualifiers. What Putin tries to do is not rebuild the Soviet Union in the way how it existed. What Putin is trying to do is actually to rebuild the Russian influence and control over the space in a very post-imperial and post-colonial terms, where the, the system of those controls will be actually much more efficient and much less costly than it was at the times of the Soviet Union. I, I think that Russia had turned its corner back in 1991, 
making decision that the old and traditional empire, even in the form of the, how it existed during the Soviet times, is the thing of the past. This is too costly. What we see now and here is a creation of this post-Soviet space that would, be, that would be controlled by Russia. And from that point of view, it doesn't come as a surprise that we hear all these uh, comments coming now from uh, people like Nazarbayev. Uh, saying that in the next few years we'll see a major realignment and changes in the world politics and, and basically indicating that, that uh, Kazakhstan probably will be moving uh, closer to China, trying to, to... So everyone is running for shelter. Um, I, I'll finish with, with, this, with this photo again. Um, I, I have some, some other, uh, other images as well. Uh, it's, I, I found it, it really interesting. It's the meeting in Milan. And uh, there is only one person around the table who needs translator and interpreter. And for me, this is not about language, really. This is about the language of politics and the language of, of international relations. Uh, for me, this is a symbol that Putin sit, certainly speaks a different language from, uh, from the rest of the world. OK. Thank you very much for your attention. And I will be, of course, happy to answer questions. This is Europe, as seen from Moscow. Yes, please. I have it. two questions. Was Georgie interested in joining NATO? And the second question is, as far as numbers are concerned, Kazakhstan has the largest Russian ethnic group after Ukraine. How did they get away with it? Well, uh, my understanding is that, yes, uh, Georgian government of Saakashvili wanted to join NATO. Uh, in terms of Kazakhstan, well, that's what makes them so nervous today, the, the, uh, because the uh, Solzhenitsyn's, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's vision, of course, of, of new Russia, how we should reconstruct Russia, includes northern Kazakhstan. But my understanding is that uh, a lot changed in the last 20 plus years in terms of that a lot of Slavs, there were uh, Russians and Ukrainians as well, had left Kazakhstan. So the, the, they, they moved the capital to the north. So from that point of view, they are much more secure to a degree that it's possible to be secure now. When you, I, I mean, to a degree that it is possible to be secure generally when you are neighboring such a big country as, as, uh, as Russia. Yes, please. I have a question about Siberia. Sure. Can you tell us? It depends what kind of question you have. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm uh, most skeptical regarding Moscow. I understand that the, the quality of air now is, is very bad there, so maybe some people decided to move to Omsk for, for a while. We'll see how, how they will deal with that. Uh, but uh, in terms of Siberia, well, we, 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 have, we have certainly uh, the, the, that kind of ideas and movement that is there certainly since the beginning of the, since the, beginning of the 20th century. Uh, how how important it is, I, I I think not 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 really. So at this point, we are talking about um, maybe some group intellectuals and youth and so on and so forth. And uh, so I I don't think this is this is really present danger for for for, for the unity of Russia at this point. So uh, um, Chechnya is of course is is is, is 
still a much, 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 much larger issue because the situation there is really, I, I, I did a lot of research on early modern history, so that reminds me the relationship between the Crimean Hanate and, and Moscovy in the 16th and 17th century, so that you pay the supaminki that, 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 that you, 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 you pay money to, to pacify them. And that's, that's, it looks like that the agreement that is, is there in Vistichnya, and it is there as long as there is enough money and, and money is flowing. Once money stops, the, the, probably the relationship will be renegotiated and maybe this, this, uh, violently. Yes, please. To, to, to Uzbekistan, huh? to Uzbekistan, Central Asia. Well, uh, basically, yes, the story is even more complex than, than, the, the, than you presented it in the sense that we have the major out-migration of the Crimean Tatars from their first after the first annexation of the Crimea in the late 18th century, then after the Crimean War of mid-19th century. So we have huge Crimean Tatar diaspora in the Ottoman Empire. So that already by the uh, mid 19th century, the Crimean Tatars were the, and certainly by the beginning of the 20th century, were the minority. And then in 1944, they were, they were, uh, uh, there was uh, forceful deportation. They started to come back in the last years of the existence of the Soviet Union, and then in the 1990s. So uh, today, uh, it, it's really uh, the difficult to imagine what what will happen there with the Crimean Tatars. They they refused to, as, as uh, a group, uh, refused to recognize the annexation of the Crimea and uh, paying a paying, uh, really high price for that. In May, uh, we had a very, at Harvard, very interesting symposium, uh, which was marking also the anniversary of the deportation of the Crimean Tatars back in, in 1944. And Mustafa Jamilev, the long-serving long, uh, mem uh, president of the Majlis, of the organization of the Crimean Tatars, was there. And months before that, he, uh, he had a telephone conversation with Putin, who was trying to convince him to recognize the annexation promising all sorts of, actually, support for Crimean uh, Tatar culture and so on and so forth. And when Jamila was at Harvard, he received news that the Department of the Crimean Tatar language, culture, history was closed and other things. And I turned to him and I said, but Putin promised you that he will give more than the Ukrainians gave and they're taking away this now. He said, yeah, but there was one condition recognize the, the legitimacy of the annexation. They refused to do that and basically lost, lost everything. Um, so uh, again, uh, in, with the war in Eastern Europe, with uh, international tensions and, and uh, uh, sanctions and uh, economic consequences of that, it's really very easy to forget about the Crimean Tatars. The, there is a probably between 200,000 and 300,000 people who basically didn't recognize the annexation and are not recognized as a, as a group by, by the new authorities. Yes. Uh, 
Thank you. Well, mm, what we see, uh, again, I, I, I will try partially answer your question because the question is, is really big. So w w what, I, what I saw in working with the materials of the Bush Library and then Gorbachev Foundation was very interesting, the, the, the amount of money that was sent to support the communist and pro-communist forces from Moscow. And uh, uh, very interesting negotiations in September of 1991, when Bush came to Moscow and both Gorbachev and Yeltsin actually agreed to cut uh, Soviet assistance to Afghanistan and to Cuba. And they were so eager to do that, that the announcement was made by Gorbachev and Baker on Cuba without even consultation or warning given to Fidel Castro. And six hours before that, uh, uh, Najibullah in Afghanistan was informed about the fact that starting uh, January 1st, 1992, there would be no money anymore. And uh, uh, again, that, that, that was a major uh, turn in, in the Soviet foreign policy which was explained by Mr. Pankin, who was a foreign minister at that time. He said, well, on the one hand, we didn't have money anymore to do that. On the other hand, we really felt that that was not the right thing to do. And there are very interesting quotes from Gorbachev, and he is saying, well, Gaddafi, he says he's our friend, but really what he wants, he wants that we would keep, keep supporting him. So the, the, the end of the Soviet Union is also the end of support for the communist, pro-communist, anti-Western forces in, in the uh, world in general, which lead to all sorts of unpredictable results, including Afghanistan. Yeah, of including Afghanistan. Yes. Well, there is more than one answer to that. Uh, what, uh, what happened was th there was uh, one major figure in Ukraine, uh, an ethnic Russian from Kharkiv, uh, Grinov, who basically originally was against independence and then turned pro-independence in the fall of 1991, saying that when you go to the people and you talk to them, you realize what they want, and, and, and he shifted his, his position. Uh, one of the explanations is that basically the Soviet Union as a project was completely discredited. It's Gorbachev with, with, uh, that uh, uh, people wanted change, and uh, independence of the republics actually was viewed as, as a way out of that, of that conundrum, that we can better manage our resources here. Uh, e e economic collapse led to the fact that they started to introduce, I remember, coupone and, and, and trying to control their own market. So the, the uh, ideology was not there anymore. The army and KGB failed in August of 1991 to keep this together and was absolutely demoralized. And uh, the, the, as collapse of the state was, was uh, starting to go, it was stopped on the level of the republics, which is a good thing because it could go actually on the level of, uh, on the level of today's Donbass. 
Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Can I ask you a question? I don't know. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, just using the metaphor from earlier, Marriage that right. possibly in those last 20 years, Russia and Ukraine were still in the union of sorts, um, economically and politically as well. And what do you think is the taking into account this last uh, this development in Ukraine? What do you think is uh, Putin's expectation of the part of Ukraine that he's eager to um, control? Mm -hmm. Great, 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 great. Sure, sure. And the rest of Ukraine will never become under Well, um, I'm, I'm, I, I, I found a lot of parallels between today's situation in Ukraine and Russia's policy vis-a-vis -vis Poland in the 18th century, uh, leading to the partitions and at the at the at the. At the time of the partitions. So basically the model is that if you can't control the entire country, and that was happening with Poland uh, before the partitions and now after the, after the Maidan, Euromaidan, then you try to partition it and, and keep under control another part. So uh, but it, it looks like that the people in Kremlin made uh, uh, learned a lesson from the history of the 20th century. They don't have illusions anymore that they can incorporate without problems places like Galicia and Volhynia and Western Ukraine. And in that sense, partitioning is the, 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 the only way to keep at least part of the country because the tendency is that in Ukraine, the, 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 the move is westward in terms of the orientation of the population, in terms of the orientation of political elites, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, so uh, from that point of view, the idea is to partition, to keep part under control of Russia. Through that also influence the behavior of the remaining part. Uh, what today most of the uh, people who watch uh, the, the, the situation in Ukraine expect is that it is very likely that uh, the new uh, invasion with uh, the use of the Russian, not just trained, but Russian regular forces can take place immediately after the G20 summit. And that immediate goal can be uh, uh, actually making a corridor to the Crimea, because Crimea, without without ability to provide supplies, actually is is a major burden. Well, Donbas is major burden for for, for, for Russia as well, Crimea as well. So this th this parts of Ukraine uh, they are not economically viable, uh, and uh, uh, a part of trying to achieve geopolitical objectives, uh, it's, it looks like that Russia tries also to, to, cut, to cut the cost of this, so this very costly uh, adventure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your question.